As we try to learn yeah. a little bit more about what's going on with Ezekiel Elliott uh, uh, temporary restraining order, you filed the Eastern District of Texas. Bringing Michael McCann, uh, SIC or, uh, senior legal analyst, joins us here uh, on the show. So, Mike, take me through this. Why? Why did Elliott file this appeal ahead of Harold Henderson's ruling? Chris, I think he did that to get a court that he thinks is better for him than if the NFL files first, because Elliott and his legal team know that back during Deflategate, right after Roger Goodell issued his decision upholding his own suspension of Brady, the NFL rushed to court in New York and ultimately, of course, won there. That case is now precedent. So Elliott and his legal team really want to avoid New York. And so they filed in Texas. I don't know if Texas is necessarily a better forum because the the precedent in that jurisdiction isn't necessarily favorable to him, but he knows he's going to lose in New York. So I think that was the thinking behind this. Okay, now that he's filed, how do you see the NFL responding? I think the NFL will, one, try to move the case to New York. That's a procedural step. And then secondly, they'll argue that his arguments really are not legally meaningful. The NFL will argue that even if the process wasn't great, used to judge Ezekiel Elliott, Article 46 of the CBA gives Roger Goodell, and by extension anyone he picks to hear an arbitration hearing, with enormous latitude in deciding what a punishment is. So it, it's, a, it's a hard place to be in for Ezekiel Elliott's lawyers. He has excellent lawyers. Uh, Jeffrey Kessler is a terrific lawyer. Uh, I know he didn't win the Brady case and he didn't win Peterson, but he won parts of those cases and he has to deal with a legal document that's really disfavorable to players. You mentioned that Tom Brady lost his case. Does the Brady case offer any kind of roadmap for how this could go, how long it could take? Yeah, I mean, if if it takes the path that the Brady case took, we're looking at at a minimum six months and perhaps longer than that. Now, Elliot is also going to file a petition for a temporary restraining order, which, if granted, would allow him to play, but they are seldom granted. Maybe he'll get one, but they're really hard to show because he has to show, among other things, that he has a high likelihood of success, that he'll suffer irreparable harm. They're going to try everything they can. There's no question about it. But none of these fights are necessarily favored because, at the end of the day, Roger Goodell, and by extension anyone he picks, has tremendous power. Best guess, Mike, if Harold Henderson upholds it all or a portion of this suspension, is Ezekiel Elliott on the field for week one? It's, I mean, the odds are no. If we look at precedent, if we look at what the law tells us, the odds are that Elliott will be suspended for week one. And it's going to be hard for him to overcome that. Is it impossible? No. And we never know if he gets the right judge. I mean, there are all sorts of things that can play out. But the odds aren't good for him. But this is a different jurisdiction. So uh, he certainly can't have uh, any worse of a time there than he would have in New York. Talking to Michael McCann, SI legal analyst, joining us here uh, on the Dan Patrick. Show. Mike, as, as, I'm, as I'm reading through a, a summary of all this, and of course, this is just breaking uh, this morning. One of the things that stands out is that in this filing, this uh, alleged testimony by Kia Wright Roberts, the NFL's director of investigations, who apparently testified that she was the only NFL employee who interviewed Tiffany Thompson and that she would not have recommended discipline for Elliott based on what she found. Did that stand out to you at all? Yeah, it certainly stands out. If we look at it and say, if anyone's looking at this from a neutral perspective, we would say that's pretty important that the one person who interviewed the accuser didn't believe that it warranted a punishment for Elliot. On the other hand, I think, you know, I hate to say it, but legally I'm not sure that matters because under Article 46, it's Goodell's call as to what is the punishment. And he could have reached that decision on all for all sorts of reasons. So it's meaningful from the standpoint of common sense for public relations. I'm not sure if the law attaches the same level of meaning. Does the fact that Elliot was never charged with a crime or there was never any adjudication help him at all in these proceedings? Not really. The, the fact is Goodell doesn't need a criminal charge to punish a player. I think it's meaningful in the sense that it suggests that the case against him isn't as strong as uh, some believe. But it, but in terms of does it authorize a punishment, does it impact whether or not a punishment should be upheld on appeal, the answer to that is no. 
speculate for me here a, a bit, Mike. The, my issue with a lot of this is that the NFL is acting as investigator, judge, and jury on a, an incident and an alleged crime that, that effectively brands a guy for the rest of his life. I mean, if this goes through and Ezekiel Elliott is suspended for multiple games, it'll always be a footnote in his, his life, his career, that he's been branded a domestic abuser. Do you have any problem with the NFL, despite the fact they did do a thorough investigation, conducting this process the way that they did? It's, I think the NFL has the worst system for player conduct matters. If we look at the other league, I mean, just look at the NBA. Does the NBA ever have anything like this? No. The NBA avoids, right? I mean, it's a totally different dynamic in the NBA. It's almost as if in the NFL there is an invitation to have a legal fight over a player suspension. So I don't think this is a good system at all. I think a better system would have someone neutral if a suspension is after a certain length. Uh, But that's not what the players agreed to. And at the end of the day, there's a contract, and that contract is the collective bargaining agreement. And until it's changed, I don't see this type of dynamic going away. Expand on that a little bit, Mike. How different is the NBA's process than the NFL's in something like this? Well, one is, from what we know informally, the NBA and Players Association have a much better relationship uh, on all sorts of levels, but including on matters of player discipline, that they communicate with each other, that there's some degree of trust that I don't think exists with the NFL and Players Association. And then secondarily, if a player sus- a suspension in the NBA is more than 12 games, there's a right to an independent arbitrator. There's no right to an independent arbitrator in the NFL. So here, if we say... a Let's say in the NFL, if a punishment is more than two games, suspension, the player has a right to have someone neutral hear the appeal. I think that would be a much better system than what exists. That would lend credibility. That would ensure that any serious player punishments are heard by someone neutral. And then the player can't say he didn't get a fair shake. Hey, great to visit with you, Mike. Great stuff. I appreciate the time. Thanks, Chris. Take care. That's Michael McCann, the SI legal analyst, joining us here Uh, on the Dan Patrick Show. The Dan Patrick Show, weekday mornings on Audience.